All right, welcome everyone to our speaker series here at the Non-GMO Project. It's really great to have you here. I'm Hans Eisenweiss. I'm the Director of Marketing and Communications here at the Non-GMO Project. This is now the third in our speaker series. We're really excited for our guest today who I'll introduce here in just a, a few moments. I do wanna take a moment to acknowledge that I am talking to you from the ancestral unceded territories of Lummi Nation and the Coast Salish people. Um, this is something we're doing more and more here in our meetings and our conversations is just acknowledging um, our ancestral friends and neighbors who have lived on this land for, for centuries, for generations, and encourage you all to look, um, look into uh, your own histories and traditions of the indigenous, indigenous people who um, were formerly caretakers of, the, of, of wherever you live today. So as I said, I'm Hans Eisenbeis. I'm the director here of marketing and communications. Um, we're super excited to host Diane Wilson. She's the author of the excellent new novel, The Seed Keeper from Milkweed Editions. Um, before we actually get started, I just want to remind everyone who's joining us today that we're actually um, giving away five copies of this book today. We're going to put up the sign up link in the chat and you'll have um, until midnight tonight to sign up to win a copy of this book that I think is going to be an award winner when when the right people read it um, because it, it's it's quite moving. So Diane Wilson is a Dakota writer, speaker and editor who has published two award winning books as well as essays in numerous publications. This new novel, The Seed Keeper, was published in March of this year, and it really deals with the clash between the Sioux people and the white settlers, colonists, in the 19th century. Many of these Northern European settlers were farmers in the territory of Southern Minnesota, who literally occupied the stolen lands of the Dakota. What resulted was the Dakota conflict of the 1880s that culminated in the largest mass execution in the history of the US, 40 Dakota from communities that had been deliberately starved and removed from their ancestral lands who were captured and hanged by the US government in Mankato, Minnesota on December 26th, 1862. But I wanna be clear that this is not actually a historical novel, that's really the background. It's the telling of a story of the trauma that came from those events in history as it plays out in later generations and how industrial agriculture and the control of food became what it is today, really told through the narrative of one Native American family, fictional, and how traditional indigenous stewardship of the land was torn away from people who had cared for it and been sustained by it for generations. But it's also really a story of hope of the power of seeds to emerge from slumber and the possibility of renewal for the seed keepers and of being in right relationship uh, with, with nature around us and all, all that she provides to us. Diane received the 2013 Bush Foundation Fellowship as well as awards from, from the Minnesota State Arts Board, the Jerome Foundation and the East Central Regional Arts Council. In 2018, she was awarded a 50 over 50 award from Pollen Midwest. Wilson is the former executive director for the Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance, a national coalition of tribes and organizations working to create sovereign food systems for Native people. Diane is Midwankanton descendant and she's enrolled uh, on the Rosebud Reservation. So without more further ado, Diane, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. Can't wait to hear you read from your book and, um, and maybe take some questions. Thank you, Hans. It is really wonderful to be here today. Hamantaki api, ampetukinde iushkiang wachiang kapia, Diane Wilson and Makiapia, Fide Wakantwan Oyate Hamatahaya, Sichangu Oyate Ed Omawapia. Hello, all my relatives. It's really good to be here today. Uh, my name is Diane Wilson. I am a descendant of the Fide Wakantwan. Oyate in Minnesota, and I am also enrolled on the Rosebud Reservation in, in, uh, in South Dakota. And I just, um, I just appreciate the opportunity to introduce myself in the Dakota language, which is always, um, as an elder told me once, a, a really good way to remind people when they are on um, indigenous homeland. 
And of course, with Zoom, we are on different homelands, uh, potentially across the country. So thank you, um, non-GMO, for the invitation to be part of this uh, conversation today. And we're going to begin with uh, in a video that I had um, the opportunity to put together based on, uh, it's a video poem that that opens the book and it's an opportunity for the seeds themselves to say, um, to speak as a character in the book. Um, and then, and to raise, to remind us of that original relationship that human beings have always had with seeds. And then after the video, then we'll, we'll get to questions and readings. We are hungry, but the sleep is upon us. We are thirsty, but the mother has instructed us not to wake too early. We are restless, chafing against this thin membrane, pushing back against the dark that bids us to lie still, suspended in a near death that is not dying. We hold time in this space. We hold a thread to infinity that reaches to the stars. The mother gave us patience stronger than our hunger, stronger than our thirst. We dwell in the realm of dreams and spirit. When the sun draws near, we awake and embrace the warmth fed by the soil and nourished by the rain. When the cold returns, we withdraw once more to rest and to dream. We remember when all of the world had its own song. To know the song was to speak to all beings in their own language. The land told stories of far away places, of mountains and cliffs, and verdant valleys. The mighty river sang its slow course along the ridges once carved by a glacier. Long ago, when the frost was still dug deep into the earth, the humans came. They sang us awake and offered gifts of prayer. They came as humble relatives with a pitiful need to see their children survive. An agreement was made. We surrendered our wildness to live in partnership with the humans. Because we cared for each other, the people and the seeds survived. For many generations, this agreement was kept. Our hunger was fed. Our thirst was quenched. Our restlessness was fulfilled each time we breached the earth's crust to reach toward the sun, toward the stars. Then came a long silence, a drought of memory, a time of endless darkness. They came no more, calling us with song and prayer. Still we waited just as the mother had instructed. The earth kept spinning through her seasons, but the humans did not return. Now, our time is almost gone. The pulse of life flickers, dims as the heartbeat slows. We cannot wait much longer. I think we're back. Yes, are we back, team? Yeah. 
We're good? Mm -hmm. All right, we're back, Diane. Thank you for that beautiful uh, video montage, that beautiful poem. Uh, but this is this is a book of poetry, but it's it's prose, right? So yeah, <laughs> I don't I know. Just, I veered off into poetry in that beginning. <laughs> yes, well, it's a it's a great kickoff uh, for that for this novel. Um, maybe before we get started with reading up some excerpts, you could tell us what what really inspired this book. You did a really good job actually of capturing it in um, in the epilogue and in the acknowledgments. But maybe mm -hmm. that's another nice um, way of of setting up this novel for folks who have not read it, what inspired you to write it, um, what historic events and and maybe um, the values that you have as a as a, a Dakota and connected to um, food issues, food sovereignty issues and all the rest and, and how you how you manage to actually um, create a, a fictional narrative to capture some pretty big complex ideas. Yeah <laughs> um, good question. So um, I, for me, the, the, the process really started about 20 years ago. And I'm both, I'm a writer and I'm a gardener. And so 20 years ago, I heard about these very old indigenous seeds that were being grown out um, in a small, on a tiny little farm that was just south of the Twin Cities. And it was one of those moments where I thought, I heard about the seeds and I and what I heard was they had um, Cherokee Trail of Tears corn and they had 800 year old tobacco and and Hopi black turtle beans and my immediate response was I've got to go be with those seeds I need as a gardener and a writer to be part of the work that's happening around those seeds and I really had no idea why other than it was part of my own cultural, uh, my own search for cultural identity. Um, back then I was working on a memoir. So it made perfect sense to me that these seeds uh, were also carrying stories. And, and they were also, they were, um, they were a living remnant from our ancestors who had planted them and shared them and grown them. And so I got involved with working with the seeds themselves through a small nonprofit native organization. And at the same time, I got involved in, a, in an event called the Dakota Commemorative March, which was to honor the, um, it was about 1700 women, children and elders who were force marched um, from the Lower Sioux Reservation to a concentration camp at Fort Snelling in Minnesota, which is about 150 miles. And this was right after the 1862 Dakota War that you mentioned earlier, Hans, in that, um, in that same time period. And it was during that removal um, that the, the Dakota women who had, who had no idea where they were gonna be sent, but they were being removed from the state. This was part of ethnic cleansing in Minnesota. But um, just prior to being rounded up, these women, sowed their seeds into the hems of their skirts and, in, and they hid them in their pockets so that they would have these seeds, no matter where they ended up, they would have a way to, to uh, provide food for their families, but they were also protecting the seeds themselves. And when I heard that story, I just thought that level of interdependence, that relationship that existed between Dakota people and these seeds and the way that they helped each other survive and the, the level to which those women were willing to go to protect seeds, just it, it inspired me to understand that that's the responsibility we still carry today, that the our work has shifted so that we are dealing with these external threats like, um, well, genetically modified organisms. That technology, I think, is a is our modern day um, threat. That we have to bring that same level of responsibility to taking care of those seeds. But then to put all that into a novel, it um, that's what took me. That's what took me. The you know I worked on it probably across. 10 years during a time when I was also working with, with elders who helped me really understand 
not only seed, but food sovereignty from an entirely different perspective about the relationship that indigenous people have always had with, um, with plants and animals, with the world around them. And then, um, and then it, it helped me see that um, one of the ways that is really so impactful in terms of understanding the world around us is through story. And so I began working on this as a novel because I really wanted to capture the experience of those women as, as it's right embedded in the heart of the novel. You don't get there right away. It's one of the, the characters that um, it, whose lives, uh, there's four women and their lives are braided together. But we see how the experience of those women then evolves into uh, um, across generations and through various assimilation policies, the way that relationship shifts and the way that those seeds themselves eventually even disappear. Awesome. That's, that is very moving. I, I, I have to admit that I get a little, a little teary and, and weepy every time. I, I, this is such an amazing book and, and just thinking about it, preparing for this and talking to you. It's, it's really very moving. So maybe we should um, hear an excerpt from the book now. And uh, so our, our audience can get a flavor for how you create this pretty amazing fictional narrative around these, these kinds of um, deep, deep issues. Well, I, you know, I really appreciate that, Hans, knowing that, that you have that emotional connection to this story, because that's, that's what it, that I think is one of the um, most important themes in the book is is reconnecting to that relationship that um, I think as human beings we've always had and that indigenous people have um, taken such care to to maintain over so many generations. So I appreciate you saying that. Um, the piece that I thought I would in this first reading, there are four main characters or there's four there's four women characters who speak in their own voice, but the main character is Rosalie Ironwing. And she is, um, she grows up uh, partly in a foster family in Mankato. And then um, out, of, of, uh, out of desperation um, and a need for safety, she marries a white farmer. And, and they, build a, they build a life together. But he, when he dies, um, and she's around 40 at that point, then she decides to go back home to her childhood home on the reservation where her father had, had raised her till she was 12. And so what I'm gonna read is this first, um, one of these early sections where Rosalie is just returning home now to her childhood home. In that first moment, it seemed as if nothing had changed. A coyote track crossed the small clearing and trailed off into the woods. From the high branches of an oak tree, a lone chickadee repeated its name, chickadee dee dee. The snow had drifted almost to the windows on the north side of the cabin, covered the stairs to the front porch, pushed up against the screen door. The shuttered windows, the cold chimney spoke of long absence. I couldn't move. My heart drummed fast and hard as the snow inside my boots began to melt. The wind dropped to a hush silence as if the place held its breath, waiting to see who had returned. I knew it was a foolish time of year to come, and yet here I was, finally, a mere two hours of driving, less than a hundred miles north of the farm where I had married and raised a child until John's death the month prior woke something in me. I had begun to dream again. At night, I returned to this land where my family had lived for generations, land protected from farmers and developers by its bony soil and steep slope toward the river. My life had begun under a full moon in this cabin. I was the only child of Ray Ironwing and Agnes Killsdeer, a mother I never knew. My father said, I entered the world in a wide-eyed silence. My first breath was a deep sigh. And when I left, when I was taken away, I had believed I would never return. 
I felt a sudden urge to move, to release the trembling in my legs. In the back of the truck, I found John's shovel and slowly carved a rough path to the front door, breathing hard as I swung each scoop of heavy snow to the side. I was relieved to find the door unlocked. My father always said it was better to let hunters use the place than to have them break a window to get in. The door swung open with a loud creak from unused hinges. I stamped the snow from my boots and brushed it from my pants. When I stepped inside, the air felt even colder in the dim light, as if the freeze had burrowed into the wood. My breath floated in a cloud of white vapor. I was afraid to touch anything, afraid it would all simply turn to dust or become a dream from which I would wake. I made a slow circle through the room, remembering the couch that sagged in the middle, one corner propped on a block of wood. A narrow table under the window, its paint chipped and faded, where I used to do homeschool lessons with my father or read books in the dim flickering light of the kerosene lamp or harvest the inner bark from red willow branches with my small knife. The enamel percolator blistered with rust was in its usual place near the tin where my father kept his coffee. His blue summer cap hung from a hook by the door, as if time had not moved on or changed anything since I left, as if he might walk in through that door. How strange and oddly familiar to think that nobody knew where I was, just like when I'd lived in foster homes after my father's heart attack except I would not spend my days waiting and watching the door for someone to find me. Coming home was like swimming upstream, searching for the beginning, for the clean, unmuddied waters of my childhood. Lovely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have some questions. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about Rosalie, your main character, is uh, I think the setting is the 80s or the 90s, 1980s, 1990s, if I'm not mistaken, maybe maybe uh, later than that. Um, and she clearly uh, isn't in touch with her own uh, history, indigenous knowledge around farming. She's married a white farmer. Um, so there's this odd um, tension at the core of the book, which was uh, originally colonists moved on to stolen land they forced um, indigenous folks uh, off their land onto reservations. In many cases, they actually used food as a weapon. They start, especially on the, at the lower agency, they actually starved um, Dakota who, who wouldn't leave the land. And yet at the same time, there was this view that um, we could convert um, Native Americans to Christianity. We could turn them into farmers in the white colonialist mindset. Um, so I wondered if you would talk about that a little bit. A, um, you know, food as a as a as a weapon of war, the way it was used against the Dakota, mm -hmm. and then at the same time, weaponized in a sense in in the way that uh, white colonists maybe farmed and wanted to force um, sort of uh, agricultural assimilation onto Dakota and southern Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Well, as we know, it was all about the land. Um, but but even beyond that, there was a, I mean, there has always been from the very beginning that clash between two worldviews, one of which saw land as something that could be owned um, and that and brought a very different sense of relationship to the plants and the animals and the, and the land itself. Um, and then a worldview that believed that land could not be, be owned and that we as human beings co-create the world we live with, it, the world we live in with everything around us. So in Dakota, there is a saying, mitaku yeowasi, which means we are all related. And so if you're related to the plants, say in your garden or the plants that you see growing out in the woods, then you're going to treat them in a way that is as respectful as you would one of your own relatives. 
And, and so it was that clashing of to those two understandings of the way the world worked and the, the place of human beings in it. Um, in, the, in, a, in the settler view, human beings are the dominant um, life form and, and plants and animals and everything else actually are subordinate and, and are intended to support human beings. And in an indigenous worldview, human beings are really on the bottom because we need every we need everyone we're dependent on plants we're dependent on animals they don't need us and so it's um so when you put those two worldviews together then it was it was a very um that that's where that it that i think the heart of the conflict came from and that and then as i was doing my own history historical research and, and trying to understand what had happened to Dakota people, both prior in their encounters with, um, with settlers and then what happened during the, the eight, and then as they were moved onto reservations, the Dakota used to live, actually uh, had a vast uh, homeland area that eventually became um, more focused around uh, the Lakota in South Dakota and the Dakota in the southern half of Minnesota. But when that was then reduced to a, a reservation where they could no longer um, hunt and gather wild foods, um, then what you see is um, people who have uh, people who have been removed from a traditional way of life, because that that gathering of food, that that way of relating to your food, was uh, central to who we are as Dakota people. And so I realized at one point, well, I could tell the story of what happened to the Dakota through what happened to their food, mm -hmm. and that's you know that's how central and that's how important it is, and that today then. What we see is so much of that knowledge has been displaced and that that then the healing around the trauma that I think we're frozen up here on my end anyway. Is returning to these indigenous foods. So that's why that was such an important theme throughout the book is to just juxtapose those two, show how they have both um, how show the contrast in the two and then just raise the question and then what does that mean to human beings how does that impact all of us on this planet yeah that's that's amazing profound I love the way that you nothing like talking to the author of a book about what you know <laughs> the structure of it and and the, the core juxtapositions uh, I love it well let's get back to another reading here I don't want to monopolize the the opportunity our audience has to to hear directly from you and, and, and hear directly from the book? Well, this one I think is um, really, really uh, connected to the, the work that you do at non-GMO. So there is a section of the book because of the, what, the evolution that seeds have gone through that I, I do raise that, um, that story about, that, about seeds then becoming, um, transformed through, through um, you know, technology. And so there is a, a chapter in the book when Rosalie is, she's still living um, on the farm with her husband, John, and her teenage son, Tommy. And she's really, this is right after GMO seeds were released and farmers are struggling with the decision of whether or not they, uh, they take on this new technology. And so um, this is just a little bit of the thinking that wrote the struggle that Rosalie was going through in seeing what was happening to the farm. A few months before the first shipment of, of GMO seeds was due to be delivered, I knocked on the door of Tommy's room. He was a young man now and kept it closed all the time. His deep voice cracked as he called out for me to enter. Inside, clothes were strewn in untidy heaps. A math book was open on his desk and he sat playing his favorite video game. He looked at me with curiosity. So seldom did I come to his room except to put away laundry. What's up? Tommy, your father listens to you. If you tell him not to use these seeds, he'll pay attention. 
Why would I do that? I told him my fears. Then I added an argument that I hoped would spark a memory of what he had learned as a boy. It's not right what they've done to these plants. It's not right to take life apart like that just because it will make money. You remember when you were younger and we talked about how the corn feeds the little voles who become food for the hawks. How the sandhill cranes eat the leftover seeds when they stop here to rest during their fall migration. Even the crows rely on field corn to survive. What happens to the birds when they eat these seeds? What happens to us? Nothing, mom, nothing is gonna happen to the birds or to you and me and dad, except that for once we'll make some good money. Even you can't argue with that. After that conversation, I barely listened when Tommy and John talked about the farm. I didn't wanna give up, not when the Minnesota River was already one of the most polluted in the country. But I wondered if there was a different way for me to do this work. I had tried to be like Gabby, who used her skills as a lawyer to fight threats to the river and the land. Maybe it wasn't my way to fight from anger. Maybe I needed to learn how to protect what I loved instead. For now, at least, that left me with my garden. I poured my time and energy into caring for her, feeding the soil with manure I spread with a shovel, watering the plants by hand. Some days I sang to them, serving up a mix of my father's old powwow songs. A library book showed me that the tiny seeds I had taken for granted were actually unique living beings with their own history, story, and family. Each seed was made of an embryo, a seed coat, and something nutritious, almost like a packed lunch. The mother plant, like me, wanted only the best for her babies. Some plants, like dandelions, scattered their seeds in the wind, while others, like some pines, needed fire to open their cones. Somehow, the mother knew to dry her seeds almost completely, so they would sleep until the time was right to wake. Each seed held a trace of life that would spark when given water, when given the appropriate conditions. Everywhere I looked, I saw how seeds were holding the world together. They planted forests, covered meadows with wildflowers, sprouted in the cracks of sidewalks, or lay dormant until the long awaited moment came, signaled by fire or rain or warmth. They filled the produce aisle in grocery stores, Seeds breathed and spoke in a language all their own. Each one was a miniature time capsule, capturing years of stories in its tender flesh. How ignorant I felt compared to the brilliance contained in a single seed. I had begun to see that when we save these seeds, when we select which ones will be planted again, our lives become braided into the life stories of these plants. It's beautiful, thank you. Um, that, that's an excellent passage for a question that I have for you now, and, and we may wrap up on this as, we, as we've been together for a half an hour here. Um, we've all been hearing more recently this term seed sovereignty and food mm -hmm. sovereignty, and um, I know that you've worked in this area a lot, and mm -hmm. I know in my experience that a lot of non-Indigenous people don't really understand the concept of sovereignty. So for a, a, for a person like myself, or people in our audience who maybe uh, aren't Indigenous, how can you explain sovereignty in a way that, that is really meaningful, both seed sovereignty, but sovereignty more generally? Because I think this is really a critical issue for non-Indigenous people to understand. Mm hmm. Yeah. And I, and um, that's a great question. <clears throat> and I do like to think that one of the one of the really important aspects of doing this food work is that it actually impacts all of us and that the work that we've been doing in indigenous communities um, has some great teachings and lessons for all of us. And that we actually do find um, common ground in our food work so that a lot of 
when I see or, um, organic farms or permaculture, what I see is these are these are ancient indigenous teachings that have been brought back to life in with more um, modern terms. So um, when when I was speaking earlier about um, say let's say specifically the Dakota people who in Minnesota. <clears throat> where hunters relied on the, 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 um, their hunting, a lot of wild gathered plants, um, including berries and nuts, and then also gardened, um, growing the three sisters, so the corn, beans, and squash. And so that, that this was a traditional way of life for Dakota people, and part of that was it was a it was also a spiritual practice so that the the planting the harvesting the significant moments in the gathering of your foods um, especially when you are taking a life then these are these are always um, you always offer prayer you offer your tobacco you you have your ceremonies to show your gratitude for the plants and the animals that help sustain the lives of human beings and so when when um, when, pe when um, Native peoples were moved onto reservations and lost access to their foods, it was also, it also displaced some very important cultural practices. So these prayers, these ceremonies, um, in addition to what were very healthful foods. So this was a diet, not to say it was easy, but these were whole foods. And, at, and back then there was no type two diabetes, for example. So then you move, you move um, people onto reservations, you give them commodity foods that come in a sack. So it's high starch, high fat. And immediately you see a shift in the, both the spiritual and the physical health of people and the emotional well-being because you are how it's very it's very compromising to your sense of self as a as a um, an indigenous person to be living in this way and so um, immediately we see all these these uh, diseases emerge within a generation or two and so we get to today where you see lots of statistics about heart disease um, uh, type 2 diabetes, um, the high rates of trauma that result in alcoholism and suicide. And part of this has to do with the trauma that's been experienced through things like through events like boarding schools. But part of it also comes from the fact that a very important part of the culture was displaced when tribes were moved onto reservations. So food sovereignty is a movement that's gaining a lot of momentum in restoring those original traditional indigenous foods as the diet for native peoples. And these are closely connected to the place you live in. So it's all about local foods. Um, and so the food sovereignty, seed sovereignty, it's all about restoring that relationship with our indigenous seeds. So um, in my own garden, for example, I do grow the corn, the Dakota corn that I talk about, I write about in the book. And that is a way of, of connecting back to those women, the Dakota women on that march, on the removal, who were hiding them in their skirts. And the fact that they protected them so that future generations would have them. And they're the reason why I have them today. So when we begin to do that food sovereignty work, what it really means is we're reclaiming that old relationship. We're reclaiming those prayers, those ceremonies, and we're rebuilding the health of our communities by returning to those traditional foods. Wow. That's really beautiful work. <laughs> it's joyful. You know, we who doesn't love to come together over a good meal? Yeah. <laughs> well, those words are profound indeed. And I, I want to close this out here by, you know, encouraging our audience here to um, to try to get one of the five books that we're giving away today. And if you can't, by all means, run, run out and buy a copy of this amazing book. Um, we couldn't do it justice in such a short reading. And, and uh, I had some burning questions I had to ask you, Diane. So thank you for indulging me on that. Um, we love your work. We support your work. We want uh, all of our followers um, on Facebook here to um, 
to check it out because it's it'll be well worth your while. Um, a wonderful novel based in some profound truths um, for all of us. So thank you so much, Diane. I think I'm going to switch up the screen here so people can see how they can um, attempt to uh, win a copy of your book. Hold on just a second here. All right, I think we're good to go there. And with that, I will bid you farewell, Diane. I'll hope to talk to you again and catch you at a, a, a reading in real life. Hopefully mm -hmm. we're gonna get back to that world again. And thanks so, so much for all of your work on these important issues and for um, educating our audience today, mm -hmm. um, not just about your book, but about all these um, deeper issues about our relationship to, to food and the earth and nature around us. So thank you again. Well, thank you, Hans, and thank you for all the good work that you're doing it <clears throat> with non-GMO. Thank you very much. Yep. Vidamaya.